Hello, welcome back to another edition of Peloton on Pause, brought to you by Green Edge. Uh, this is the Hitters edition. We've got some absolute superstars from the Mitchell and Scott team, uh, all the way from Colombia. We've got a guy, Esteban Chavez, also known as Dos Pacos, or in Spanish, that's Tupac, and Anamig Van Vluten, also known as the best bloody female cyclist in the world at the moment. Uh, how are you guys? All good. Yes. All good. <laughs> Hard awesome. times, but all good. We are healthy. That is important thing. Uh, Esteban, you, you're in pretty extreme lockdown at the moment. You you can't leave your apartment. Is that correct in Colombia? Yeah, I'm in, in Bogota and I'm in the apartment since five weeks ago and they say this week we will be till 11 of May here. So that is a, a really hard thing. That is the, the best way to do thinking in the humanity and all the country and everything. So we are, we are in luck for that. And uh, the first thing I noticed, mate, is you've, you've gone the shaved head. Is this so that you don't look like an innocent little baby face anymore? you would <laughs> gone for the, sort of that hard prison tough guy look? Yeah, I, I like to – I will do some tattoos also. Yeah. Some piercings for for look more a little bit aggressive because, you know, always is like cute and smiling and come on, yeah. I need more – that's 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 not the real you. It was always hard to give this perception that you're this really nice, fun-loving guy. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and uh, and and Amik, uh, how's how's life in uh, in Holland at the moment? Yeah, pretty sunny actually. I uh, I still wait for some rain. I said I take a rest day when it's going to rain, and I think like I'm now five six weeks uh, in a row we're still training outside uh, in the sun. Um, so the health situation with me is good and also in the Netherlands we get a little bit more in control so that's good and uh, we can still train outside but we have to keep distance one and a half meter and everyone's doing really well I think with that so I'm, I'm pretty proud uh, of the people from the Netherlands and, um, yeah it's a bit hard to stay motivated uh, to be honest um, with, without a goal but um, I also found like I also enjoy uh, riding my bike in the Netherlands though I miss Colombia. Yeah, I was going to say you—you you actually went to Colombia at the start of the year and and did training there. What what made you go there? Um, I asked about actually uh, encouraged me to go. I was already in after two thousand eight. I want to go, but then I broke my knee in the World Championships in Innsbruck, so I had to cancel my plan. So actually, I had a flight, but I could not cancel it. And then I just with my leg just on the oper- in the operation, I changed my flight uh, one year. Uh, I have and um, just felt like, oh, if I don't use the ticket, I don't use it. But um, so then this year I went and uh, I liked it so much that I went back again. So I went twice actually this year. Um, Esma, what is it about the Colombian people that love cycling so much? I mean, I remember the, the scenes around the bus in, in 2015 when you burst onto the scene and I, I'd never seen anything like it. It, w- it was just mayhem. Um, and ever since then, you know, I'd jump on the bandwagon, I'd wear the jersey, I'd, I'd call all the fans my people. Um, what is it about cycling that, that sends them crazy? Yeah, that is because when cycling started growing up in the country in the 80s and 70s, it's a rough moment for the country, you know, all this about drugs and uh, dangerous plays, blah, blah, blah. So in that moment, cycling go to Europe and they start smashing and winning races so the people in Colombia are really proud because uh, cycling changed the perspective to the world for the Colombian people it's a sport people, healthy good person so we are really proud of cycling and it's part of the of the culture so when enemy comes for example everyone go with air and show the country, show the different fruits and we are really proud for show the beautiful part of the country because we, we want to change the mentality of the people about Colombia and show the, the real Colombia. How was riding in Colombia, Anamik? Did the, the supporters get involved? How was it out on the roads? Yeah, I had a lot of moments that people want to take selfies and uh, sometimes in the middle of nowhere and I stop for one second and then yeah, then the people are like, oh, you're on a for Vleuta and uh, can I have a picture with you? And that was yeah, so random, I mean, like in the middle of nowhere, a place where 
Yeah, we know it, you would not expect it. It was, yeah, it was funny. And yeah, I, I second what, uh, what Esmon said. Like, people are so friendly and uh, really into cycling and also into women's cycling. I don't, yeah, they didn't really yeah, care about, I don't know, they also all knew me. It was a bit surprising for me. And um, yeah, and, and it's just fantastic to train there. Like, it, it's so beautiful country and the people are the best. That's the best uh, bonus of the country, I think. The people are so nice and so helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So did uh, you did you guys get to ride much together at all? We ride like two or three or three days together. Yeah. It's enough because anime goes so fast and anime <laughs> really anime smash every single one professional bike rider in Colombia. Now really? no one now the people go in motorbike with her. No one wants to train with anime. She goes so fast, like for eight hours by day. It's this, ridiculous, man. This, this could be a problem, man, mate, because you're going to get blacklisted wherever you go if you, if you train as hard as you do. You gotta, you gotta take it easy. I got a lot, a lot of flag on the, on the, on my right, on the, actually on the Strava. Yeah, that could not be true that someone went so fast. It was pretty funny, but um, I was also thanks to Esmeralda because he went so fast and I tried to. Oh. So, uh, yeah, also to get, get away from all the people wanting selfies because you're right that was one thing I couldn't believe uh, even at the at the big races they're just obsessed with selfies a lot of a lot of the Colombian fans and then sometimes near the end they can get quite aggressive like there was times there Esteban where I thought you were going to get swallowed up by the crown and we'd, we'd never see you again particularly the, the women that are sort of 60 years old a little bit older they're, they're the most vicious I noticed with you, Esteban. Yeah, I have I have a problem, and maybe you can help me with that, guys. This is also because the reason I shave because I have one target between girls till eight at twelve year old, and it's one big important gap. And the next girls look after me is like fifty five going up. So it's it's because you look like a teddy bear, you know. The little cuddly <laughs> teddy bear. Um, yeah. You, you, Esteban, got to race in the the Tour of Colombia and the oh the national for the national team and the national championships. You've been wanting to do that for a while. How is how is that this year? Uh, that is is beautiful. It's really a special thing in the national championship. I race with my brother, and we finished both in the top twenty. I think I finished fight for my brother 18 or something so that is pretty special I'll answer the tour of Colombia the last stage finish in my town in Bogota which is the capital and we crossing all the town from the middle and that is full full of people made and that is a pretty special I never raced like professional bike rider in Colombia in my first time so it was really really nice with all my family my friends my people is it's special uh, good stuff, mate. Now, talking about training again, Anamique, I saw the two-part documentary series on, on the team's website, and uh, episode one, you got to train with the guys uh, at the start of the year. What was that experience like? Uh, horror. <laughs> horror experience. <laughs> How is that? Uh, yeah, it's something like you look forward to, and then you're there, and then you think, like, oh, yeah. It was not so good plan. It's it's going to hurt all week, every day, and a lot of teammates. Why did I think this was such a good plan to go here? But then in the end, it also suits me perfect because I like to be smashed. So uh, it's actually perfect. I don't need to smash myself. I just follow the guys and try to hang on. And uh, it's perfect training for me. And also actually really nice to me. So I'm just one of them that um, they don't treat me any special. So uh um, yeah, it was uh, it's such a cool way to train a lot of kilometers. Is we go from A to B, and um, that gives me a lot of energy. Also, like every night you sleep in a different hotel, and um, yeah, so good training. So, uh, it's just all the time a little bit out of my comfort zone, but then also not for for 100 kilometers, but 100, 240 kilometers and 4,000 meters of climbing. And every time the road goes up, it's like. Yeah, yeah, that's nuts. I saw uh, a <laughs> video that I'm I saw, like. I saw Swain Tuft was on the camp. Um, did you get to chat with him? Uh, yeah, much at all. He's he's quite a knowledgeable guy. Uh, grizzly yeah. man. 
Yeah, it was nice. I, I knew him only from uh, doing yoga in uh, in Lepelbed in uh, in Belgium. So uh, where I saw when he was still active as a pro rider with, uh, with Mr. Scott with our team. And now it was nice to speak to him, like how his life um, uh, after uh, quit uh, to be a professional cyclist. And uh, it was nice to speak to him. He joined for a couple of days and uh, very experienced. And that was also the reason why uh, why he joined. It was, was nice that he was there. Um, and then also saw in the, in the second part of the season, uh, you then got to race uh, with the World Championships jersey for the first time that you went on to win. Um, what was that experience like? Did you feel extra pressure having the rainbow bands on at a, at a race? Yeah, unfortunately, I had only one opportunity to race with uh, rainbow uh, stripes. So I have a good record this year. It's like a 100% score. Uh. Um but yeah, for sure you feel the pressure. I felt like, oh, if if I do a shit race now today, then they don't quite, oh, the curse of the rainbow jersey. But um, no, yeah, newsblad, I, I won directly. So it's nice to have like one out of one. So uh, then they cannot talk about that anymore. No, for sure. It must have been all the Ks that you did uh, beforehand uh, to get your base ready to go. Yeah. I think I never was so fit at the start of the season with Colombia before and then with the team camp of the guys, there was a perfect combination. Like a lot of teammates in Colombia, which, which I also really enjoyed. And then uh, the team camp, yeah, I was pretty prepared. So. I think you have a base for the next 10 years, so no worries. <laughs> no, I think, I think I have some time. <laughs> well, one of the things that um, come out of the, the doco as well is... is your, your training and, and your ability to push yourself to levels that, that most other uh, professional riders probably won't go to. Is it, is it a hard balance to find training hard and then dipping over and training too hard? Is that, is that the hardest thing to get right? Yeah, maybe. But for me, I, I, have, I like to train hard, but I also really like to rest really hard. So I'm not a girl that... Um, cannot take rest so some people some some athletes have troubles with that but I also I'm also sometimes really lazy so I take my recovery also really serious so um, I think that's that's why I keep a good balance and sometimes I also can feel I had some days with the Midtown Scott camp that I arrived in the evening I felt like ah, oh, I was so smashed I felt like if I feel like this tomorrow then I will not uh, join them tomorrow the next day but uh, yeah my recovery was also pretty well and then the next day I went wake up and I felt good and like, oh, just go for it. But um, I pushed myself to the limits. But yeah, I, so far, always been lucky that I never pushed myself too much. But you need to be on the edge to, to, to get more fit. So you need to stress yourself to the maximum, but not over it. And yeah, it's a hard balance. But I think it's also with experience. Do you find I that... Uh, I can't believe you. You smash yourself too much. <laughs> it's unbelievable. You have to ask for coach. I'm also really good at resting. I rest like this. No. But no. also, do you find that now that you're uh, your world champion, it validates decisions that you make? Like people go, oh, well, if you're world champion, then everything that you do must be right. So do you find more people now come to you for advice and just get, give me the secrets because, you know, I want to I be successful? Do you find that a lot more people are coming out of the woodwork for that? Uh, not that they really ask me, but I find more with my colleagues uh, colleagues that uh, journalists ask them, like, oh, shouldn't you train as much as Anamik is doing? And, yeah, that, that's a bit annoying, actually, to be honest, because what works for me is not working for everyone and it also has something to do with my age and build up for years that I can do so much volume. So for a young athlete, I would never advise my what I'm doing. And uh, if young athletes come to me, I always uh, um, yeah, would give them not the advice to do as much as I do and, and give them advice that it's a process of years and that they have to take really careful, be careful and yeah, listen to the coach and, and not to what an other athlete is doing, I think. Uh, Esteban, in, in terms of training, I reckon that uh, when you first come on the scene, when was that, end of 2013, and you, uh, I remember when you f went to the first training camp in Australia and everyone was like, who, who is this kid? When you looked at about 12 years old, you, I think you had the braces and we were playing yeah, cricket yeah. and we asked you to bowl with the cricket, but we didn't realize that you'd had the shoulder surgery or whatever. 
Um, yeah. And then it seemed like there was a real breakthrough for you leading into the 2015 um, Vuelta. What what changed for you that snapped into gear in terms of training and preparation? Because I remember that year you rolled up to that race and everyone looked around and was like, shit, Esteban's on here. He's looking lean, hungry, ready to go. Yeah, in, the, in that moment, because... Like and I mean, say everyone have a different process. So I come from one big injury. Also the the team uh, look after me. I think a little bit too much and cuddle me and treat me with a lot of love and don't push me maybe too hard at the beginning for all that. But after the the second brandy I did in 2015 at the Giro. Uh, Steve will come to me and say, okay, mate, we, we treat you really well. We understand your situation. And I know you have more to do. You have more to work. Uh, if you want pushing hard and work hard, uh, we support you. But if you want just do like this, like you do, we support you as well. So that changed my mind and realized I can do a little bit more. So I come to Colombia, like kind of make these days and I smash myself every day important rest and i arrive at that vuelta super lean and really good perfo and yeah that's a beautiful year beautiful vuelta how much uh, confidence did you take from that vuelta that year um did you really have a, a big belief that geez if i can get results like this i'm just sort of scratching the surface on on what my potential is yeah it's, it's unbelievable because before before beforehand always is a question mark and that well I realize I can push and hard myself and my body for three weeks and give me the confidence for train hard for look myself for look the diet you know but that doesn't arrive just because that well that that arrived because all I trained before because I did the Giro that year as well because I did the Vuelta the year before and I did race by race by race and I never stopped train and that never arrived like magic but when I arrived you realize okay I can do it and this is why I work so we we need to continue and keep pushing is is the hardest thing and this is a question for both of you when you're riding for things like uh, general classification and you, you arrive and you're feeling really good, is the hardest thing trying to contain that feeling where you just want to go out and attack and smash people? Because I, I remember, Esteban, that 2015 Vuelta, there was one stage, I think it was the day that all the fans were there. And steve take was you got pretty excited because the fans were sort of revving you up and there was a moment where he wanted you to hold back, but you attacked because you're feeling good, and then you pay the price a week later. Is that the hardest thing, I'll ask you, Anime, to, to contain that energy that you have at those longer races and, and to really, you know, be smart on how you use that? Yeah, no, it's for everyone that I hate conservative racing. I really like attacking. So I'm, I'm originally maybe in my head more a one-day racer. And with stage races, you need to race always conservative. Think about the days that are coming and only attack at really smart times. And yeah, I, I struggle with conserve energy all the time and race a bit negative. So I don't know, it's for everyone and it's for him even more important because more respect for the guys. They have three weeks uh, stage races. With us, it's only 10-day zero. Um, and I found it already hard to, to to race like that for 10 days, 10 days in a row. Is, is that been the hardest thing, Pacos, to, to work on? Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty hard because when you feel good, you, can, you want to show. But also, you need to be conservative because it's another week or it's another 10 days and the hardest days are to come so it's it's tricky with the mind because it's so nice when you win a stage and personally i prefer win one or two stages they finish six or seven in the gc you know because you are conservative so that is a that is a tricky thing and that's always one thing you need to talk also with your director with your teammates and leave everything clear but when you are in good shape you want to show 
but also you need to be conservative thinking in the future, one writer like myself, for example. Um, one other and thing. Feeling, and the feeling of winning, like what, what Esvan is saying, like winning a stage that gives you like, so much adrenaline. And then in the end, if you win the stage race, like the general class race, you don't have that really that goosebump feeling of coming, crossing the line as the first one. And I, I don't know, we are maybe a bit addicted to that feeling, but um, yeah, in a in a time trial or in a, in a stage race, in the, in the, if you win the GC, you don't have that. It's such a beautiful to, to be the first one across the line. So yeah, I struggle with that not to go for the stages also. Another factor with um, riding GC or being a leader on a team um, is you've got all these other people around you that you need them to suffer so that you have a better chance of winning. How important is it to maintain good relationships with your teammates? Um, and is there anything that you do particularly to, to you know, make them want to ride for you? If it was me, I'd just, you know, give them lots of treats and um, tell <laughs> as many jokes as I could. Is there anything that you do, uh, Annemiek, to, to motivate your, your teammates? Yeah, I'm very lucky with my team that I actually don't need to motivate them. Um, I found it very special uh, to find out that everyone really wanted to be part of the Giro team. And it was uh, before we were not very interested in going for the GC, but now yeah, everyone really wants to be part of the team. And it's a bit of a fight of who, who can go to the Giro, which made me really proud. Um, yeah, and... You, I feel responsible. Yeah, I feel responsibility as a team leader uh, for the team. That if you see that one of the girls is is not feeling so well, you talk a little bit with them and what's going on. And um, yeah, you so you you really really feel responsible that you have to do it together, and that everyone needs you need to take everyone on board. And if someone yeah is having a not a good day, you talk with them and yeah try to cheer them up because yeah, you really need everyone and th and that's important. I feel responsible for that. But I think if you have a good team, then it's everyone is motivated from itself. What about you, Esteban? I remember 2016 Jira, I think you draw you drew little pictures for all the teammates <laughs> and handed them out. Um, it, it, do you find it really important part of your job to, to have that really strong relationship with your teammates? Yeah, that is, is, is super important and you need to to find the time for know the people and know every case different and separate the people and make the real connection with every single one, not just the riders. Of course, the riders are super important, but everyone is involved of the of the team because like Anamic says, every single piece is, is super important. And actually I, I really like and I really love to have connections with the people when you have that special connection, when you share some stories, when you share some fears, when you share some strength, it become like your family. And it's different when you work to one teammate and when you work to your family. So I love that type of connection and I really like talk with the people, like really deep things and all that stuff. Uh, good Actually, stuff, Mike. There's no better team bonding or team building uh, way of than just doing a grand tour together because everyone has his highs and lows and fears in, uh, in one of those days. And you can go for a training camp together, but then you don't have this feeling for under pressure. or And it's, it's a beautiful thing to do together. And... Um, one of the things uh, me and Amanda Spread uh, asked for is like to have also uh, a team dinner afterwards to celebrate or maybe not to celebrate, but in the end, two, two times we could celebrate the, the victory and also with the staff and with the Spaniards, the mechanics, the team directors, so everyone together on one table. And I, I found it really special that you can also really celebrate and that everyone uh, of the staff also has a feeling that they had a part in this uh, in the victory. And, I think that's one of the most beautiful things of the stage racing. You do it together with the riders, but also with the staff. It's, it's an interesting point. Like, how important is it, Esteban, to have the, the periods where you're, you're racing and you've got your job, but then to have those periods where you can switch off and just enjoy each other's company and relax and not, and not think about racing because the racing side of it's hard enough, particularly over a three-week race, yeah? Yeah, you need to, to find the time also for disconnect. When you do just one thing, 
too much it's not it's not it's not nice you also you can't rest too much and also you can't love uh, love too much you need time for everything and you need to pick when is the right moment for this when is the right moment for this and be serious in that so when it's time to joke everyone joke and everyone laughing and blah blah, blah. when it's time to be serious it's time to be serious but always we need to do that with respect and give the space to the people like you see in the grandis is different the the mood in the first week and in the third week mm. the third week the people is tired and the people want to be a little bit more alone and this is more normal sometimes you are moody or they are moody and this is com normally and is understandable and also you need to understand that um, talking about balance between sort of cycling and, and the life outside of cycling, Esteban, you've, you've got a foundation that you're extremely passionate about. I remember talking to you three or four years ago and you said, well, when my career is finished, uh, I I'm, I'm probably want to be known more for my foundation and the work that I'm doing at the moment than actually as a bike rider. Do you want to explain to people, you know, what is your foundation and, and what is some of the work that you're doing at the moment? Yeah, we, we, we start that foundation more or less five or six years ago. The foundation are pretty young and we have two different ways to attack. One thing is we support kids here in Colombia between 15 and 18 year old in one team, the Esteban Foundation team. And we support with bikes, with helmets, classes, the kid, we, we provide the uh, coaching, nutrition, and they go to the races in all the calendar here in Colombia. And in the other way is we do one crowdfunding at the end of the of the year. And with that money we raise, we made surgeries for kids who have uh, orthopedic problems in the country and don't have the, enough money to do it. I think all the athletes and the people need to give, give, or give back the, to the society what the society gives to you. And this is my, my way to do. And I want to uh, make the surgery and support so many kids how I can and send the message to everyone the dreams come true. I'm a one normal person in Bogota and completely... Uh, normal guy here and I work really hard with my family and now I can talk with you in English, I can talk in Italian, I travel for all world. So if I can do, anyone can do and this is what I want to show with the with the foundation. Uh, good stuff mate. It's uh, it's great work that you're doing, Pacos, and uh, encourage everyone to get to get behind it. Um, we're gonna take a, a first break. Uh, when we come back we're gonna talk cycling cravings presented by Giordana. All right, we're back. Cycling Cravings presented by Giordana. I'll start with you, Anamik. What is it that you're craving the most now that you're not at racing? Mm, racing in my World Championships jersey, I think. Yeah, I miss that. That's such a shitty thing to be World Champion this year. Yeah. Do you reckon you could file for some sort of compensation like uh, when racing fires up uh, at the end of the year they can sort of backdate a lot of the races that you missed out on and let you wear the bands next year uh, I just keep my fingers crossed that the world championships will this year be organised and that I can um, uh, race again this year because the course is really beautiful this year in Eglin so um, yeah it's a good opportunity to um, earn maybe the stripes again Actually, I forgot to factor that in. You're probably going to go back to back anyway, so it won't really matter. Um, <laughs> what, 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 what about um, <laughs> so? Is there any uh, any parts that you miss in terms of like I've seen what it's like at races? You know, you don't have to worry about washing. You know, you get daily massages. Is that oh. is that sort of stuff that you you miss as well? No, no, not at all. As horrible. No? to do it myself so no that's really not something i miss uh, i miss me, my team and yeah. uh, to work together towards a goal um especially when uh, we had a team meeting with the team with the girls i felt like oh i really missed the contact with them and the fun and the laughs at the table uh at dinner maybe 
Um, yeah, maybe also to be just in the peloton in the bunch with also the international girls. Um, yeah, you, you don't have really a lot of contact now with them. And I also really like to to chat a bit with them. So um, yeah, I miss I miss also the, the complete complete bunch. Mm. What about you, Pakos? Uh, what are you missing the most at the moment, mate? Uh, I'm really missing half a plan. I think uh, anime and myself and mostly of the professionals, athletes, past the last yeah. 15 or 10 year old, uh, years, having a plan and having an objective. And now it's like no floor, you know? So that is a bit hard for me. And also I love a lot to travel and knowing people share my stories with the guys and like i said before you have a real connection with the guys with the seniors with the mechanics with the directors uh, a long a long long time i don't see them face to face and i miss i miss that contact with the with the with the people with my team with my guys and uh, yeah traveling go to the race preparing i i really love the feeling you have the day before you start a race you know that uh, beating in the herd and all, all that is involved in the race. How, how much has it made you realize uh, the little things that you take for granted, Esteban? Like, obviously, the ability to just go out and go for a long ride. Like, once they do let you out, I mean, you're going to be like a little Colombian dog let out of a hot car. You're just not going to know what to do with your freedom. <laughs> yeah, that is, that, is, that is hard and you realize a lot of a lot of things, you know, like sometimes at the end of the season, you you complain because you need to travel again in airplane to do to go to the one race. And now I really was I will really want to travel in one plane. So a lot of things and simple simple things like this, like take the bus from Barcelona to Andorra, where is uh, where I live. Normal, normally we say that is a bit annoying, blah blah. But now I want, to, I want to do, and all that is 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 involved. The dinners, the see the guys. I miss Nikki. I miss like you said, massage, and all all that normal things. And sometimes you pass for granted. Do you find that out make it? It's really put things into perspective. Um, what's important and what isn't. Yeah, I think so. Uh, cycling in this situation is not so important at all. I think health is so much more important. And um, also this situation made me realize that we're, I think, a uh, bit more too much focused on that we have everything in control. And in this situation, we, we are not in control. And um, that makes me also appreciate uh, more the simple lives that you usually take for granted. Uh, just go outside and ride your bike. That's now a really special thing that I'm I'm really happy with that I can still deal, uh, do this in the Netherlands. But I really feel for my colleagues that uh, like Esteban that are like locked in their houses. And if I'm not so motivated to go out training, I uh, appreciate even more that I can still go outside. And um, yeah, and when the restaurants, for example, open or the cafe, everything mm. is closed here. And I miss it so much to go to a restaurant or to a... Uh, to just uh, have go for a simple coffee somewhere, and um, yeah, I, yeah, you appreciate more that that there's so much you take for granted, and uh, that makes mm. life more beautiful and more a little bit more nice. Yeah. Do you have uh, Uber Eats in Colombia, Esteban? Yeah, yeah, we have that once, and another two or three apps, super similar, but yeah. like anime says, it's it's not the same. Just go for. Uh, one cafeteria and take the coffee and the sunshine is in your face and see the other people walking and laughing or fighting or whatever. Now we can do that. Uh, that simple things you we will appreciate even more next time when that will happen, 100%. Yeah, for sure, mate. Um, all right, well, we're going to have another break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about victories. All right, it's Inside the Victory, uh, presented by Scott Sports. Uh, now, we've finally got two guests. Uh, no offense to my previous guests, but uh, we, we did struggle at times going through the Rolodex of victories. Uh, but at least with you guys, you, you got a few to choose from. Uh, I'll start with you, Adam. What, what victory 
do you rate as, as the best uh, and why? The World Championship uh, victory this year. Yeah, 105 kilometers solo and then that the World Championship jersey is waiting for you and uh, something I was really, really, really looking forward to to wear one year. So, um, yeah, that was a very special one. Obviously, it was a race that, you know, you would have dreamt of as a kid one day winning the bands. Was it everything that you you dreamt of growing up? No, never. I was never dreaming of growing up. I was a student. I was drinking beers and uh, 10 kilograms more heavy. It was not Oh, here we go. This is the podcast we wanted. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about those days. Yeah, I just, I just, I've cleaned it up a little bit in my house and I found some, like, uh, some student time uh, that we wrote something in a, in a book uh, after we went back from, um, from going out. And it was so funny to read. Like, I, I couldn't believe that wrote all those things there so yeah it's, it's completely different life i had um yeah until i was 23 years old so i was a full gas student then so i was never dreaming of being world champion wow so you you came into cycling really late then yeah yeah i just finished my uh, master degree and in my last year of the university i went to cycling because i got injured in my knee uh, with soccer yeah. ah wow. okay what did you study what was your master's in yeah, that's so extremely funny. Epidemiologist I am. So the current situation is really into my... Uh, it's the one. Yeah, uh, you know, that's the right? Yeah, but it's really long ago. So uh, I think also all the beers uh, deleted a little bit of my memory, uh, of, of my of my knowledge. But uh, no, yeah, I, I'm following the news with a bit extra interest uh, because of that. So when when did you start thinking of the world then as a, as a real goal uh when did you start saying okay i'm gonna lock this one in and we're gonna we're gonna work backwards and build up for this uh pretty late because we had so many world championships courses that didn't really suit me or and before we had also mariana Vos always it was always our leader and like there was no discussion about that i was far not as good as she was so I think since 2016, since the Rio Olympics, I started to believe a little bit more in myself about also my climbing uh, capacity. And then, yeah, in Innsbruck, we had a really beautiful course of uh, there was a lot of climbing. So it was the first time I thought that it would be possible to to go for a win. So yeah, only 2018, really, really late in my career. So as you said, in the actual race itself, you attacked at uh, 105k to go. Was that part of the plan? And and what were you, your coaches and that thinking when they saw you off the front? Because obviously it's a, it's a long way to go. Yeah, the, the plan was to make the race hard there with the national uh, with the national team. So me and Anna van der Brecht would make it really hard on that climb. There was this only really hard climb in the course. And uh, to be honest, when I analyzed uh, the course, uh, I think one year before, I saw that there's one super steep four kilometer climb, and I felt like yeah. That is a possibility. And uh, I said this to my coach and he said, like, uh, ah, good plan. So like, yeah, there's only one thing. It's 105 kilometers from the finish. <laughs> yeah. But, um, um, yeah, once I started it, uh, the national coach uh, in the, in the said, like, oh, yeah, you have a good advantage and Anna van der Berg is behind you. And, uh, yeah, go for it. And it surprised me actually a little bit that our national coach said that. Um, Loes Gunnewijk, uh, I felt like maybe she will say, like, wait for them, it's a crazy plan, but she was really encouraged me to, to put them under pressure, and yeah, Anna also behind me, it was a good situation. So, obviously, you had a lot of time to think uh, by yourself out there. Um, you must yeah. have been doing cartwheels at one point. What, what were you thinking coming into the final where you, you start thinking, hang on, I, I think I've got this in the bag? Was the emotions really starting to kick in? Yeah, but every time when I I, those moments, those thoughts came across my mind. I thought like, no, I cannot think about winning today. I really need to stay uh, focused on like on the corners, on the on the roads. I cannot make any mistake until the finish line. So I think only in the last kilometer when I had such a big advantage, um, yeah, I won two kilometers before I started to enjoy and really put myself head up and, and looked at all the audience that was like cheering for me. That was, that was super cool. All right. What about you, Esteban? What, what victory means the most to you? Uh, I, uh, 
I will take the Lombardia one. That is a beautiful day for me. I really love Italy, and I have a lot of friends where we finished the day. I, I used to live in 2013, 2012 in that city. Uh, it's called Bergamo, and we finished in Lombardia that year there. And was was pretty special because four or 500 meters before the finish line, this one is straight. And the last corner is to the right. And in that strike, we passed for the healthy insurance. And I visit that place a lot, a lot, a lot of times to see one doctor in 2013. And the doctor told me I need to quit cycling. I can't recover my show there. I, be, I will be a no rider again. I need to take the insurance and forget about cycling. And yeah, for three years after I pass in front of that, leading the race with another two guys, and I take the sprint. And yeah, I, I had a, a good fun that day as as a pretty special, it's a monument. And yeah, it was it was beautiful. You're the uh, first Colombian to win a monument uh, with that Lombardia victory. Um, another guy that's pretty passionate about that area, Shane Bannon. Um, was he quite emotional after the finish? <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of a lot of people in the team cry that day. I'm including, and Shane, Shane also. Shane also loves Italy, and the the base team is is in Italy, and we have a lot of Italians on the team. And you know, the a monument is a is a pretty pretty special thing, and the people know also the the story behind that for myself, and that makes even even more special for everyone. Um, you're a rider that wears his heart on his sleeve. Um, you're not afraid to get emotional at times. Uh, the victory at the Giro uh, last year would have been also a pretty special one with your, your parents at the finish line. I, I saw a video shared the other day on, on social media. Um, that, that must have been quite a special one as well, to have your parents there embrace you at the finish. Yeah, that also is beautiful, beautiful one. Normally, in your career, you, you can win one stage in the Grandi not many times. Uh, some riders never can do it. And I did, and my parents are in the finish line. And also the story behind with my sickness the year before, 2018 and 2017, and that two hard years, make that in the stage 19, realize also again to myself, I can do it. I can push myself really, really hard for three weeks and I can win a stage and I can be one of the best riders in the world. So it's like one freedom that day. And um, I always smile and I always a bit of cry, of course, but that day I'm yelling and I have freedom and I show to, to myself, I, I, I can do it. <laughs> hey, good stuff, mate. I was waiting for you to drop an F-bomb. You, you did well. We got to 43 minutes. Uh, all right, we, we're going to take a break, and then when we come back, we've got some uh, fan questions uh, in our Ask Anything segment presented by Shimano. All right, we're back. It's Ask Anything presented by Shimano. We've got some fan questions. I'll rattle through them. Uh, we'll kick things off on Instagram. Uh, Charity Gerano has got a question from the Philippines for both of you, and that is, what would be three things you know now or learned about professional cycling that you would have wanted to know in your first year? It doesn't have to be three. It can be one good one if you want. I'll start with you, Anamique. Oh, uh, ask about first, please. Okay, ask about <laughs> you will You will copy my answer. <laughs> Come on, yeah. Esteban. What, if you if you got to talk to a younger Esteban, knowing everything that you know now, uh, what what's one of the key things you'd you'd say to that guy? I will say to him, like, mate, in the school you need to learn English, <laughs> and also I will say Australian. to him, <laughs> Australian mate, and also <laughs> I will I, I will I will say to him like, be focused, science. Uh, day one because the time just going fast and the time fly and when you realize and you look back it's three years already you're professional so since day one just 
go bananas for everything. Mm. What about you, Anna, mate? You're talking to the uh, college student who's drinking and eating and just having a wowzer. What, what would you tell that version? Ooh, that's... Um... Actually, yeah. you, don't, you probably don't have to tell them that much because you, you're quite <laughs> successful. You train hard. You've, you've got a good routine. Yeah. Probably just okay, say, I would hey, just, just enjoy. Just enjoy yeah, what Copy me, copy me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I would advise them to keep it simple because uh, it's not rocket science to to be uh, one of the best uh, athletes. I always felt like to be world champion, you need to do everything perfect and you need to be the perfect athlete. But um, I realize I'm not the perfect athlete. For example, I go lots of time. I go after 12, also today, because it's now uh, 12 o'clock, um, late to bed. But still, you can be not being the perfect athlete and you can still be world champion. And uh, it's also a bit about balancing your life and not doing everything perfect. Uh, keep it simple. It's not about 100,000 details, but just do the good stuff. Do it good and do it hard and, and rest hard and work hard. Uh, but don't think it's on all the... Yeah. Um, yeah, it's focus on, on the important stuff. I, I would say that. I think I, when I was a young athlete, I thought it's also about a lot of hundred thousand t- details. But in the end, keep it simple. Yeah. Have you heard of Have you heard of the Kiss method? For sure. Yeah. yeah. There you go. The Kiss method. Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, okay. Uh, we've got another question from Anol Anolson Four. Uh, what's the best roommate that you've you've had? I'll start with you, Esteban. Well, that is a hard one, but uh, I will take Billy's, of course. We we are really close and we are understanding really well each other. And mostly of the grandies I did, I I did with him and it's a, it's a really nice one. Also, the others are, are really good, but I will take Billy. Okay, I'm sure I'd love to hear that. Um, Anamik, what about yourself? Uh, with me, I think Spready. Spready is really good for me in the Grand Tours to um, set me to bed a little bit in time. She's a bit more disciplined and also to remind me that I need to stretch and uh, roll and use my foam roller. She's always better with, we have also uh, always a bit of a contest. Uh, who's the first one to use the foam roller? And uh, she always wins. So uh, she uh, she's really good uh, roommate for me also to be a bit relaxed off in the after the the race and uh, we put on some nice music and uh, it's a good roommate for me to have some laughs also and don't take it too serious to keep it a bit relaxed. Yeah, we had uh, Spratty on one of the early episodes and uh, she spoke very highly of you, Anamik. So you'd be uh, happy to hear that. Uh, we've got another question um, and it is from Jezza Keen. Uh, do you guys have any aspirations after you finish professional riding, uh, Esteban? What do you want to do after cycling, mate? I want to look a lot after my foundation and continue growing up. And I have a really big dream and I want to change the world and show to every single kid in the world that dreams come true if you work hard like I did. Uh, good stuff, mate. Uh, and Amik? Yeah, I think I would like to improve human health in general uh, with getting people more enthusiastic to use their bikes to their work. Uh, it's also a bit more uh, better for the for the environment. Um, so some kind of projects like that, or maybe we work with young athletes to coach them. I would also uh, like that, yeah, to give them a little bit of my experience. Uh, but yeah, that that would be cool. But can also yeah something with with sport related and bike related maybe also. Okay, um, we've got another question, which is from Apowenski. Some of these names on Instagram, it's like, I don't know if they're made up or they're just deliberately hard to pronounce. Uh, they want to know, what, what foods from your home countries do you love the most? I'll start with you, Esteban. I love arepas, which is one, how do explain that? It's one, like bread, is is. Yep. is uh, circle and is made from corn so it's, it's awesome you don't like can I come well, on the colombia i love colombia but the colombian food is really not my favorite food oh that is not true uh, i see i on. see you i see you the biker is smashing the bread like come oh, on yeah. I love this. This is yeah, yeah the bakery is awesome the bakery is awesome i love bread 
yeah, I love bread. The, so you, the, 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 the main dinners are yeah. and not your cup of tea, Annemiek? No, the arepas. And uh, we, we had a lunch together. It was actually really nice. But I like more the, the dancing was me the highlights, not as much the food, to be honest. Just how, how the how the Colombians going to react next time Anna makes there, particularly at restaurants? Yeah, um, they went close to you for sure. I know they give me just some <laughs> Colombian. They just give me some Colombian food, and then well, I'm, I'm I'm happy. Well, well what what other what other foods that you like then? What what's the best ones from uh, Holland? Uh, we don't have good food. No. <laughs> 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 don't go on the vanillas for good food, but um, they are, um, my mother has a like a if she, she makes like kill, it's like boer kool, it's it's with kill and potatoes, and you smash it, oh, it yeah, on top, yeah, it's like a winter kale and potatoes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. sounds delicious, sounds yeah, awesome. <laughs> Okay, okay, move along. Maybe, uh, maybe just the stroop waffles, the shoe bottles. Stroop stroop waffles, waffles, yeah, they're, they're good. Yeah. Oh, I've had many of those over the years. Don't worry about that. Uh, TKB wants to know, you, you ride for an Australian team. What's your favourite thing about Vegemite? Have you tried it? Uh, you know what it is. I think you've both tried Vegemite, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, I have a story for that. For you, okay. Jensi, the, the first time when I went in Australia, 2000. Uh, 13, you give me Vegemite like straight from the spoon. Like I thought it was Nutella or something <laughs> sweet. And that it was awful. Like awful, mate. After I I learned how it is with the butter and in yeah. the toes and that tastes really, really nice. And when I have the opportunity, I, I take some ones to, to Colombia. Yeah. Uh, have you tried it? Vegemite and a meek? Oh, yeah, for sure, but he made, made it uh, to try, but uh, oh, I hate it. No, I don't love it. Also, not with the butter and uh, no. no. No? Not even when you spread it thin with the butter? No? No, I say just take half a slug or something sweet, something nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think you just, just stick to the potatoes and kale. Spread yeah. that on your toes. Yeah. Delicious, delicious. All right. Um, we've got some questions. We're almost finished on Twitter from Mark Hill for Anamique. Stroop waffle or torta de manzana, which is apple pie? Ah. Ooh, I know this guy. Uh, yeah, he made it hard. Ooh. Ooh. No, no, he, he's, I know him from Tenerife <laughs> training. Um, yeah, I couldn't choose to be so bad an apple pie. That's that are both favorites. Delicious, sweet fate. Yeah. Yeah. If you had to pick one, would you go with the street waffle, apple pie. Yeah, fresh baked, yes. Okay. Uh, we've got one from Juan Munez. What's the most difficult thing about being a pro cyclist? Start with US Barn. For me, it's uh, be far from home. Sometimes you stay uh, like for the Australians or for the American people, you know, Latin American people, uh, all America. You stay a, lo- a long time afar from home, so I find that pretty pretty hard. Yeah, and uh, what about you, Adamik? I think that's a 24-hour job, so it's not that after the training is finished for us. No, you, you need to stay focused on your food and on your recovery, so it's, it's never really over. And um, yeah, like also now in this period, we cannot sit for three weeks on the couch and doing nothing because then we need to build up for months because you lose it so easy. So it's, yeah, you need to stay focused. Yeah. Also after your training and if also if you don't have competition. Yeah. Final question. This is from Facebook. Alison Bruce, uh, you both had career threatening injuries, but obviously fought back to compete again at the very top level. What made of a, what motivates you to keep going to defy the odds? Esteban. One big motivation for me, the example my father gave me. Uh, we are actually, we, 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 we don't have a lot of money, but also we don't went poor. We, we want one normal family in Colombia. We need to work a lot with the difficulties and my father never give up. And my father always work and have a lot of things in the life and he continue believing and uh, show to us the dreams come through you work hard and that example when I have the hard moments is what I do continue continue pushing continue believing uh, whatever I need to do I do for follow my dream 
What about you, Anna? What about what motivates you the most? I think because I feel I have talent for for riding my bike, and I'm really keen uh, to take the challenge to get the best out of myself, and that's really motivating me. Also, after injury, I don't want to to quit because I know there's more in my body that I can use and and I can still improve, and that's really as long as I see I can improve, I'm very motivated. Uh, great stuff. That That's a good way to finish the fan questions. If you've got any questions, make sure you send them through to Mitchell and Scott on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, we're going to finish things off with a quiz because uh, it's been a massive episode. Only five questions, so stay around for that. All right, quiz time. Quiz time presented by Pirelli. Fair Sanemic, please. Well, you both get an opportunity to jump in. So okay. if you know the answer, you chime in. Uh, I believe that uh, we had a, a men versus women's team uh, with Buley, uh, and he got rolled. So the the teams, the women's team got 1-0. Uh, all right. So five questions. Uh, let's go. Question number one. Which country has the highest number of bicycles per capita of any country? Holland. The Netherlands. Yes. Esteban. Got in first. All right. <laughs> what, was, what was the answer? Yeah, Netherlands. Holland. Ah. Yeah, correct. Uh, all right. <laughs> Question number two. What year did the Beatles break up? Was it 1968, 1970, or 1972? 68. Uh, no, seven, 70. It's 1970. So Essen's up to Neil. Come on. I know you're competitive out of me. You got you gotta get all you gotta get all three correct to win. What is the highest grossing film of all time? Is it Titanic, Avengers, Endgame, or Avatar? Titanic. Avatar. No. No. <laughs> so, so there's only one more answer left. Avengers. 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 Yep. Avengers Endgame. Uh, that overtook uh, Avatar and Titanic's third. Really? Uh, this oh. is this is an absolute shellacking. We might have to go double points. Um, which question number four? Which city will host the 2028 Olympics? Paris. No, that's 2024. <laughs> Uh, it's in America. Which city? Uh, uh, I think Los I was quit at the time. <laughs> Los Angeles. The final oh, question okay. was, which state was Donald Trump born in? Was it California, New York, or Texas? Texas. No, nah, New York. Jeez. Ah. That's, a, that's, a rough, <laughs> that's a rough old quiz. Oh, what a great, great way to finish. Um, <laughs> quality podcasting there, folks. Uh, uh, each episode, I give uh, you guys a, a chance to have one final word. Um, I'll start off with you, Esteban. What do you want to say to the to the listeners out there? Uh, first, I want to thank you, John C, for this. A, a long time I don't talk to you. I hope everything is, is all right. And for the listeners, just keep it strong, keep together, uh, give solidarity to the humanity. You, we, this time we need to be together and stack together for continue. So help to each other and help to the, or not to the neighbor, to the family, because rough times are coming for every single world in the world. So we need to be together and be solidarity human for continuing going 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 on. And Anamik, one final word for all the people uh, listening and, and watching the video. Yeah, I hope everyone can stay positive and uh, stay at home, please, uh, for human health. Um, and uh, look forward to uh, to more stuff that's coming. And uh, just like me, like that you can go outside again and that you can appreciate the small things in life. Don't forget that. Like uh, just also now inside, stay in how, how inside you can still appreciate the, the small things you can enjoy together with your family inside. And uh, I hope everyone can do that. And um, then uh, this time will uh, we'll pass and uh, we can go outside again and stay healthy. 
That's a good way to finish. Um, thanks again for, for joining in, obviously, with the time zones. Um, yeah, it's it's past midnight where you are, Anamik, and appreciate you uh, taking time out of your schedule, Esteban. Uh, you, a lot of Netflix at the moment, yeah, mate? Yeah, of course. Every single series. <laughs> yeah? What, what's the best series you've seen at the moment? I, I just finished the Orthodoxes, Orthodoxes, you call in English. Uh, is that Ozark? No, no. no. Or- Orthodox is, is about this uh, this girl in New York with this is Jude. She's Jude. I don't know the, the the words in English. And she come to Berlin for try to Skype of her culture. You know the Hamish? I, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I think she's I, Jewish. 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 Yeah, yeah. Jewish. Yeah, she's Jewish. What, what did you say? Ju- Judas. Jewish. Sorry. <laughs> My issues are perfect. Come yeah, on. Right, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it's a good one. That sounds as good as the potatoes and kale, mate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but anyway, uh, as I said, I really appreciate you taking the time out. Uh, it was a fantastic episode. Some great insights there. So I've got no doubt uh, all the... the not just fans of the team, but anyone tuning in would, would get something out of that. So, um, yeah, really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, tune in next week and stay safe, guys. I uh, look forward to seeing you out in the roads uh, pretty soon. Thanks, Josie. Thank you, Josie. See you. See you.